Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Glyn Moody, and I'm delighted to be chairing this session on open democracy. I'm particularly delighted because I think this really is the core session of the entire forum, but then I probably would say that. Um, the reason I say that goes back to what Eben Moglem was saying so eloquently last night, which is that the reason Richard Stallman started Free Software in 1983 was not because he wanted to write another form of Unix. It was because he wanted to give people freedom. The whole reason behind free software is spreading freedom. So the free software movement is inherently a political movement. It's inherently subversive. And what we've seen over the last 20 or 25 years is how that idea has spread from the, the world of hackers out into the real world. Most obvious examples are things like Wikipedia, which is the application of those ideas of sharing and collaboration to the world of content production. But it also means things like open access, which I'm sure lots of you know about. It's the idea that scientific research should be freely available on the internet for all to share, which it isn't at the moment. It's locked away. It's essentially proprietary. And in many ways, the, the open government movement, uh, open democracy, is the last and most ambitious stage of this spreading of the ideas of free software into the outside world, because clearly it is the most subversive uh, point that one can start to change things. And so what we're going to do is explore the way that free software is already starting to influence the world of government and democracy. And so I'm delighted uh, that we've got our speakers uh, who are going to explain the work that they've actually uh, been doing in this sphere. So this is very much what's already happening. It's not theoretical. It's uh, things that are going already. Um, in particular, I'm very uh, pleased that we've got two speakers from Brazil, because I'm sure you know that Brazil is actually leading the way in using free software to change society in a very uh, down-to-earth, practical way. Uh, and first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Cristina Freitas, who is a professor at the Business Department of the Federal University of Brasilia, to talk a little bit about the work she's been doing exploring the necessary preconditions for the use of free software and its ideas in society. Thank you, Cristina. Hello, good morning. Um, I would like to start with, uh, we had a last month, we had a conference in Brasilia, Conselho, some of you I think were there, and uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, okay, <laughs> uh, he said uh, something uh, really interesting, and I would uh, like to start with that sentence. He said that uh, the international division of power among nations is conditioned by the international division of knowledge. And we can see that there is a very uh, strong relation between knowledge and power. Uh, knowledge can enable individuals, can enable uh, empowering individuals, empowers nations, and it can build a new citizenship. And uh, open source, I think, it's the key to making this happen. Um, the relation, uh, when we think of preconditions, uh, we think of open source use and diffusion in uh, the, the most broader way we can think of. That's why we have the public software and now the international public software, which is a project that is spreading in Latin America and in the Caribbean. And we're translating the programs to Spanish and English so other countries can have the opportunity of using public software, uh, treating a free software as a public good. Um, so, um, coming back to the preconditions, uh, I think open source is the first one. Uh, you, you have to use open source and diffuse open source. Uh, but uh, uh, thinking of democracy or rethinking of democracy, I think we have to think of uh, empowering individuals. So, uh, I know that uh, communities can organize themselves uh, when we have an open source community. But uh, we have to have on top of that, and first of all, education for all. So that's a, a real democracy. When we speak of democracy, we have to speak of uh, people that know what to do, people that have information to vote. We are having an election this Sunday, and hopefully we'll have the first woman president of Brazil. Uh, and uh, people know, need to know how to vote. People know what to do with the information they have. 
So we have to have something that we are calling, uh, when we evaluate programs, uh, government programs of digital inclusion, uh, information technology capital. It's a set of elements that uh, individuals need to have so they can make informed decisions, so they can be web actors, like Piotr and Pisani uh, mentioned in the book, <laughs> which I read, and, I, and I, my students like it very much. And um, so to, to have web actors in Brazil, we need to have them, we need to raise the information technology capital. So that, that doesn't mean only uh, installing machines around the, the country. That means uh, teaching them how to use the machine, what they can do with the machine, not only uh, having internet access, but what to do with the internet, how they can really produce and contribute and share and use open source solutions to really uh, make society more equal and more free. Okay. Is that so okay much. in English? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank that, you very we, much. We could follow that. That's a great intro to our next speaker, is Nazare Bretas, who is uh, Director of IT at the uh, Ministry of Planning Brazil, because I, I think she's going to talk about some of the programs that you've been putting in place for this kind of social inclusion that uh, Christiane has been talking about. So, thank you. Bonjour, Madame, Monsieur. Um, first of all, I, I need to say to you that Brazilian democracy is young, is younger than me, and, I, and I'm not so, so young, so old. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, huge challenges. We have millions of Brazilians that don't know how to read, that don't have access to electricity or simple things like this. And we are trying and making the, the Brazilian democracy be more powerful, more strong, uh, with the knowledge rights, uh, using this, this kind of uh, uh, conditions, trying to change people, change, change conditions for people live with democracy. We have a very important program that is uh, putting teachers uh, in contact with uh, formal uh, education. Many of Brazilian uh, teachers don't have, don't are graduated. And it occurs all around, along the, the country. So we are using internet to, uh, to, to put these uh, conditions to the teachers all around the world using the internet. And all these things made us uh, discover that the access to internet is a right for all, and we are trying to assure that all Brazilians will have access to internet. But we also discover that software is a public god, because we know that uh, every Brazilian pay, pay taxes to government uh, by some, some softwares, and then this money is not, not returned for people. So we are uh, sure that uh, with the huge challenges we have, we'll be uh, a little less hard to, to, to do uh, with this kind of uh, vision. And we are doing this in our country, and as Professor Christiana had said, also sharing this knowledge with our brothers, our countries, our brothers at South America countries, and all around the world. Okay, thanks very much. I think it's a very good example of how free software gives the opportunity to do this kind of sharing, which you can't do with the proprietary kind. 
there's another kind of sharing which governments can do, and we, we had a very good description of what's happening in America in terms of open data. And in some ways, that's the kind of low-hanging fruit for governments, because provided it's not too sensitive, they feel they can give this kind of stuff out and look terribly good. Um, so uh, I'm very pleased that we've got Marco Fioretti, who's going to talk a little bit about what governments are doing in this sphere and how that sort of feeds into the, the free software world. Um, yes, thanks, uh, Glenn. Um, I have been uh, uh, looking at uh, something that is closely related to free software in government in this last year, and it is uh, open data, namely open public data, data from public administrations. And uh, this is uh, an issue that is closely related to software, and especially to free software. Um, first, because the reason we use software at, uh, most of the times is not the software itself, but it is because we need to manage data, to create them and process them and publish them in many ways. So in a sense, data are the reason for, the need, for our need of free software, especially when it's public data. And the reason is that uh, public data have little value in and by themselves. They are numbers and strings that not terribly precious things. But what is terribly important and valuable is what we build on the top of those data, namely the decisions we take or cannot take, including voting, because we have or not have public data available. And be, uh, because we maybe we cannot have them in a way that it processable with free software that we can build and modify to answer the questions that we won't answer it and so in a sense they have somebody said that data it's like soil what matters is what you build on it or thanks to its uh, availability and uh, but it has like like any other very precious and valuable thing, also some dangers in it. Um, one danger is to confuse the applications of open data. Open data can do a lot for stimulate businesses, economic activity, and they can do a lot to increase, uh, to create, uh, to make possible open democracy and active citizenship. But these are two very different um, applications of open data. And it's essential to, to never forget this. Because when it comes to economy, you only need, if you open the data and make it uh, usable, processable with free software that anybody can build and use without uh, uh, limits or restrictions, then it only takes one entrepreneur or one hacker in the, the whole uh, in a whole community to uh, offer uh, to do something good for the whole community with those data. When it comes to so opening data and building free software that uses them in as many ways as possible is a good way to stimulate <coughs> the economy. There is more and more evidence every year about this. Opening data in order to achieve transparency is also crucial, is uh, essential, but it's very different in that uh, transparency is uh, achieved if we have open data, but also law that, uh, make, the most, that make it possible to, to use them, and above all, many, many, many citizens that are willing and able to use those data, not necessarily to build free software to process them, but to look at the results of such processing. So open data are, and, and their usage made possible by free software will play a huge role, but only if uh, one big uh, precondition is satisfied, which is education. To use open data to, to, to create and practice open democracy, and I'm not the only one to, to say this, uh, is coming up at every corner of this and many other congresses. You need educated people, and not only 
in uh, this is not about analphabetism. Even in the so-called first world, we have many, many citizens who are technically able to read and write, but cannot make sense of a diagram. Okay, can I pick you up on that? Because I think it feeds in very nicely to our, our next speaker, who is uh, Philippe Egrin, um, who's uh, CEO of Sop in Space. But uh, many people probably know him more for his work with La Crotteur du Net, which has done fantastic work recently. And he has some very interesting ideas about how the things we've been talking about, free software and the internet, are not just tools for uh, democratic processes, but actually redefining those processes. So, Philippe, I think you want to take my place. I, 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 I'm afraid I lose some. Uh, so, uh, first of all, of course, governments can do a lot for the conditions of di digital democracy. Uh, first, giving access to basic education to everyone, access to IT, as uh, uh, Mrs. Freitas has uh, just uh, told us, uh, access to a neutral, free, and unfiltered internet. Uh, but while they are doing that, and when, even when it is temporarily uh, ensured, uh, then we can learn a lot from society about what democracy can be. And uh, of course, Mr. Pisani has already pointed us to that, but uh, uh, I say society, not even civil society, just society overall. You know, in EU 27, the, the largest uh, definition of the European Union, uh, there are 20 percent of internet users in 2007 were producing some form of contents on the internet to be accessible by all. And uh, of course, not all these contents, or only a very small part of it, regard public affairs, but nonetheless, they are all important in terms of democracy. Uh, the, uh, but sometimes uh, what is, what's happening is civil society organizes itself to conduct uh, governance processes, uh, and here most of you, at least the part of you coming from the free software world, know about the image that is shown there, it was the commenting tool used to, uh, during the revision of a new general public license, which, which is a kind of constitution for the, the world of free software, uh, uh, and people could comment on the various graphs, and for that, uh, the Software Freedom Law Center and the Free Software Foundation developed a tool called STAT, and that tool uh, allowed to people to produce masses on, of comment on important text. At the time, what we did, we said, well, that's great for democratic applications, including in governance, but there are things that, that are not okay uh, as it is. Uh, so we tried to develop it, and we said, first thing which is not okay, it's, it's still too complex to submit a text to comments by others, and one, one philosophy we have, both in my company and I think in general in the free software world, is uh, never create asymmetry. Uh, that is, if a government can put a text online and ask for comments, then anyone should be able to put a text online and access, ask for comments. So what we do is what we call internally symmetrizing the service. We made another service with which people can, in two minutes, upload a text and submit it to large sets of, of commentators. Uh, this, this tool, we designed it uh, with in mind some of the, for example, lawmaking processes. And here I'm showing you an example uh, of usage by a politician in preparation of a law proposal. It's a law proposal on the neutrality of the internet, but there are other examples that are not in, uh, uh, related to the internet. And this is, this is really a fascinating process. I show you an intermediate stage there were several versions, and here you have hundreds of comments, really by parties who are commenting on substance. But in our opinion, it would be wrong to do tools just for that. So wh when we try to develop tools, we always try to, uh, to make sure that it can be taken on board 
in societal application, not just in government processes. And actually, the most interesting examples uh, uh, of usage of this tool here, it's an earlier version, but it doesn't matter, uh, are in education. Here it's education in, of English as a mother tongue, uh, work uh, in, on literature in high school classes, and uh, this type of collaborative processes that can occur in the classroom, they do more for creating the citizens of tomorrow uh, than something which is labeled democracy. Sorry if it was too long. Okay. Um, so I think that was a really good uh, example of how free software can actually be used to give input into the democratic processes. Um, so it's not something that's just abstract. But as I say, the main thing to take away is that free software is fundamentally a, a subversive movement. And therefore, as it moves into the world of government, I think we expect to see far more in the way of new uses and possibly pushback from the government when they realise what we're doing to them. I think they might start saying stop it. But uh, I'd like to thank our panel for really interesting uh, descriptions of the work that they're doing, things that are really going on now, not just in theory. And I'd ask you to join me in uh, thanking them for all their comments and uh, interesting things.